Hello again, and welcome to the Waters of Life Ministry Program with your speaker today, Brother Haskell Sparks. We got a great song for you today, got a great message from Brother Sparks. We always invite you at this time to call your friends and neighbors and let them know about the Waters of Life Program. We'd love to hear from you. We'll give you that address on how to reach us and telephone number at the end of the program, as we always do. And at this time, we're going to send it in the studios and turn it over to our speaker for today's program. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Brother Haskell Sparks. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thank each of you. I know a man who can. I can't take a heart that's broken, make it over again. I know a man who can. I can't take. A soul that sinks in, make it white as the snow. I know a man who can. Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all. For he's my dearest friend If you feel no one can help you And your life, it's out of hand I know a man who can I can't walk up on the water or calm the troubled sea. I know a man who can. I can't cause blind eyes to open, make the lame to walk again. I know a man who If you feel no one can help you And your life, it's out of hand I know a man who can I know a man who can that song and there's a lot of things that I can't do I can't cause the blind eyes to open I wish I could I can't raise the dead but I'm acquainted with one who has done that and who can do that and that's Jesus uh, I know a man who can take our sins though they be red like crimson and make them white as the driven snow. What a blessing. It's good to have you study the Bible with me today. So many times in my lifetime on waters of life, I have uh, stood and I've sat and preached to you the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I am so honored to be able to do that today. Uh, we're studying from the book of Philippians, and I'd like to take as a text today would be chapter 3 of the book of Philippians. Get your Bibles, turn there, and let's desire the sincere milk of the Word that we may grow thereby. Chapter 3, Philippians, chapter 3, verse 17, down through verse 21. While you're turning to that passage there, uh, we're meeting again at Crossway Church, 9.15 Sunday morning. 
uh, we're having our Bible study, and then at 10 o'clock we're having a worship service, 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights, and uh, we ask you to come and be with us, 3192 Kendrick Road. Uh, we waited uh, for several weeks. We did not have the opportunity to meet. We tried to follow the, uh, the ways that we were told by the authorities as best we could. Uh, we certainly missed gathering together. And uh, we still miss a hug and a handshake, but I pray that God will bless America once again, that we can do that hug instead of bumping elbows. Um, had a friend of mine, he actually he's one year younger than I am, and uh, he said, uh, you know, I'm just not going to uh, bump elbows with people. He said, I was at church last Sunday morning, and I shook hands with the man. I'll not call his name. And he said, I reached my hand out to shake hands with his wife and said she held her elbow up. And he said, honey, he said, I'm not going to bump elbows with you. I'll shake your hand just like I have my whole life. And uh, she said, well, this might be a little bit more sanitary. He said, how many times have you washed your hands today? She said, probably 10 or 15 times. He said, me too. He said, how long has it been since you washed that elbow? <laughs> he had a good point. <laughs> so uh, uh, sometimes common sense do, does help out. And uh, so I look for the time when we can hug each other again and shake hands and uh, do more than bump an elbow. And, and on a serious note, I've had some funerals during these trying times. And that is one of the tough times, even when you're sick and you go to the hospital, no one can go with you. Uh, you can't have visitors, and, and that is a sad time. But even in death, uh, at funerals, uh, we just have to stand back and look and weep at one another. And uh, you want to reach out and hug and hold, uh, but they say you don't need to. Philippians chapter 3 Brethren, oh, he loved the Philippian church. He said, Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now tell you weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Paul is talking to a church. This church in chapter 3, he had already give, given them a command and then a warning. In verse 1 of chapter 3, he said, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, wouldn't that be a tough command? It would for some. Rejoice in the Lord. That doesn't mean you're always going to have everything going to suit you or going your way. That doesn't mean there won't be things that, uh, that you, you dread facing. But he said rejoice. 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 You can rejoice in your heart and weep with your eyes. I had an individual once in the fall of the year, I was doing a revival and a farmer came out 
and I farmed some, and he farmed, and, and I shook his hand, and I said, uh, uh, what kind of crop did you make this year? He said, I made the worst crop I ever made. Praise the Lord. Wow. I thought, that doesn't mix. That doesn't match. That doesn't go with the thought. I've had the worst crop I've ever had, praise God. You see, he was right. Praise God when you're up. Praise God when you're down. Praise God when you're hurting. Praise God when you feel the best. Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write these things unto you is not tedious. That is, I've written, I've told you this before. And I'm going to keep telling you again and again and again. Repetition. The Apostle Peter wrote, and he said, I write these things by which I stir up your pure mind. I remind you again. Repetition is important to learning. If it's something we hear all the while, good or bad, repetition is very helpful. So Paul then, chapter 3, verse 2 Beware of dogs. He's not talking about literal hound dogs, mutts, lout poodles. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we who are of the circumcision, who worship God in spirit, Rejoice in Christ Jesus, but we have no confidence in the flesh. He said, that's where God wants us. And he said, we who are the circumcision spiritually, we who are of the circumcision worship God in spirit. We have had the heart circumcised. You see, one of the great things that was going along at this time uh, coming out of Judaism was the big deal with circumcision in Acts chapter 15. Uh, they were some in the church, mind you, that were teaching, except you be circumcised, you can't be saved. That is so foolish. It would be foolish now. And it was foolish then. But yet things like that are happening now. We want a glory in the flesh. It isn't enough to have faith in what Jesus has done for us. We've got to do something. We have to do something. We have to earn it. I quoted a passage once in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And a person said, I know it's by grace, but we have to earn it. Grace means unearned favor. Grace means unmerited favor. We cannot earn our salvation. We cannot earn our forgiveness. We cannot earn our right to the tree of life. It is a gift, Paul said, not of works. In the Roman letter, Paul said, if it is by grace, then it's not by works. But if it's by works, then it can't be grace. You can't have both. You can't have both. Now, after you're saved, you can see faith in action. James chapter 2. But to be saved, Paul said, we're justified by faith. And he used Abraham as an example. Abraham was justified by faith and not by works. So I can't be, if I believe I can be justified by my works, I glory in the flesh. And that's what Paul did not want. But he said there's some that are going about. And he says they're like vicious dogs. They're evil workers. Beware of mutilation. They just want to cut on you. And may I remind us all the foolish fallacies 
of that you have to be circumcised to be saved would mean women couldn't be saved because there's no way to circumcise the woman. The circumcision that God intended as a sign of a promise He made to Abraham, justification by faith. Circumcision was a sign of a covenant. It was not the covenant, but was a sign of the covenant. So he said, Philippians, in the church, right now, you better watch out for dogs. They'll come in viciously. And notice it's plural. Watch for dogs. Beware of dogs. They run in a pack. And people who are out and up to and allowing the devil to use them to destroy the Philippian church to destroy the church at Rome, to destroy the Corinthian church, the Galatian church, and on and on. The devil is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And in every church that's holding up the blood-stained banner of the cross, let me tell you, trouble is on the way if it's not there now. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, recorded in Acts chapter 20, and he said, After my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. That is, there will be an onslaught, there will be a wave of trouble coming from without the church. That's right. I appreciated the fact he said, After I leave, it's going to happen. That says something about the Apostle Paul. He says, it's not going to happen in my watch. But when I leave, there will be grievous wolves. Jesus warned us about wolves coming in sheep's clothing. Oh, this is the way it happens in church. They come as a sheep, but really a goat on the inside. They come as a sheep to glorify their own belly, to glorify their own appetite with the drama, with the trouble, and will find something that there's a problem with. Now that will not be their main theme. Their main theme is to tear up, to destroy, to throw down. That's their main thing. And Paul says, beware of them. And they're not just going to come one, they're going to come as a pack. And the next thing you know, there will be a pack that's trying to destroy. Because misery loves company. It's not enough being dramatic to trust solely in what happened on Calvary. That's not good enough for some. We have to have some drama somewhere else. And the devil is walking about. How does he do this? He does it from without. But he also does it from within. He said, for even among yourselves, men will arise speaking perverse things. Why, Paul? To draw away disciples after them. There are people that come into the local churches with the intentions of drawing away disciples after themselves. They come there with that heart because Satan is in that heart. They're coming from without and they also will come from within. You remember John John talked about that in the book of 1 John. He said, if they had been of us, they would have not left. They would have not left had they been one of us. They were strangers to the covenants of promise. So he said, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of mutilation. For we are the circumcision Worship God in spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. 
when Paul wrote to the Galatians, and I want you to study and look with me just for a moment. Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 1, and he said, Galatians, verse 7, or 6, he said, I marvel at you. I am amazed at you, Galatians, that you are so soon removed from Him, from Jesus, that you're so soon removed from Him. That's sad. Who is the Him? It's Christ. It's God that called you by grace. He said, I am amazed that you run off with that pack of hounds. I am amazed that you're so quickly removed from faith in the cross to another gospel. And he says, there's not another gospel. There, there is another gospel. But there would be some that would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. What do we do when we pervert the gospel of Christ? We have to slide some things in there other than salvation by grace through faith. We have to be taught that salvation can occur if we don't help God save us. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said, I have planted and Apollos watered. He said, who is Paul and who is Apollos? He said, they're just instruments for God. That's all we are. We didn't save you, my friend. We planted and we watered, but God gives the increase. Now, anything we do or say to take away some of God's Word and say, look what we've done. I remember people like that that Jesus referred to in Matthew chapter 7 with His Sermon on the Mount. And it's dangerous. He said, Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in Thy name, and in Thy name cast out devils, and in Thy name done many wonderful works? And He said, I will say unto them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He didn't say, I used to know you and I don't know you now. He said, I never knew you. And yet they felt they were members. They felt they were a part. Lord, we've cast out demons in thy name. We've done many wonderful works. I trust you don't die with that faith. Lord, I, 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 I hope you save me. Well, the reason you have to put hope you save me in there, you haven't depended on God to save you. You've depended on your works for God to save you. And I'm reminded so many times in my heart and my mind listening to an older person on his deathbed. The Brother Haskell, I reckon I've done every necessary thing to be saved. <laughs> oh, my Lord, help us. It broke my heart. And I said, Sir, when I reach this place in my life, and I shall, I will not be looking at what I have done for God. I'll be looking at what He's done for me on the cross. There's where my faith is. He called it a perverted gospel. A different gospel would pervert the gospel. So it is a perversion of the gospel, of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to think that we could do anything for our own salvation. 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, if we are an angel from heaven, if another apostle comes preaching, don't believe it. If an angel from heaven comes and preaches it, don't believe it. He said, if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. As I've told you before, I'm telling you again. If they preach a different gospel, don't follow them. Here in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, he said, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? The devil bewitched Judas, and he betrayed the Son of God. The devil bewitched Peter, and he denied the Son of God. Do you think the devil can't bewitch me or you? Oh, foolish Galatians. Now, wouldn't that be a fine way to start a sermon? The Apostle Paul says, Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? What is obeying the truth? Obeying the truth, my friend, is not works of the flesh. Obeying the truth is being saved by faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he talked about purifying your souls and obeying the truth. If you'll look at chapter 2 verse 17, he says those that obey not the gospel are those that do not believe. So that is not obeying the truth, not believing. So he said, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you and crucified. Jack, how much time do I have? One minute. And we'll begin at this point next time. May God bless you. Let's study again. You've been watching the Waters of Life ministry program with your speaker today, Brother Haskell Sparks. If you'd like to contact Waters of Life, P.O. Box 1117, Belmont, Mississippi. The zip code is 38827. And to reach Brother Sparks by telephone, it's 662-423-8767. This is the Waters of Life ministry program.